When Xilinx introduced the new Versal Adaptive Compute Acceleration Platform, it opened a new world of opportunity for compute capability. Designers can now implement new systems on a chip using processors, programmable logic, and the new AI engines, along with hard IP such as PCI Express, high-speed transceiver interfaces, and memory interfaces, all interconnected by a high-speed network on chip. I'm your host, Craig Holmberg, Xilinx FAE, and I'll be taking you through a practical tour of this new architecture as it applies to one of the basic building blocks of digital signal processing, the FUR filter. We'll discuss the different compute domains where the FUR can be implemented, the tool flows for supporting each implementation, and the available IP or libraries. Here we have the Versal ACAP domains shown in a resource perspective. Starting from the top, the AI engine array contains up to 400 VLIW SIMD processors in an array with dedicated memory and streaming interconnects. Each engine is referred to as an AIE or AIE tile, while the entire grouping of tiles is referred to as the AI engine array. This resource is available in the Versal AI core AI Edge, and AI RF series parts. Next is the programmable logic. This is the FPGA portion, which includes logic, memory, DSP blocks, and associated clocking and interconnects. This is referred to in ACAP terms as the PL, and the PL is part of all Versal parts. Third is a hard IP processing system, or PS, with multiple ARM cores, including A-series for applications and R-series for real-time processing. Also part of the PS is the Platform Management Controller, or PMC, which manages all of the domains and is responsible for initial configuration and monitoring. The PS is also part of all Versal parts. For further details on the Versal architecture and domains, refer to Xilinx document DS950. To clarify some terms you will encounter in DS950 and other Vitus and Versal documentation, consider this alternate view which shows the Versal domains in a compute perspective as opposed to the previous physical perspective. The processors are classified as scalar engines. The programmable logic is classified as adaptable engines, and the DSP58s, even though they are physically implemented as columns within the PL domain, are classified as intelligent engines along with the AI engines and AI engine array. FUR filters can be implemented in all three of these compute domains. Or in terms of physical resources in the programmable logic, the AI engine array, and or the processor system. So let's start with the PL domain, the traditional FPGA fabric portion of the ACAP. FUR filters can be built in the PL domain using CLBs, memory, and DSP58 blocks. The CLB is the primary building block for logic in the Versal PL. The Versal CLB has 32 six input lookup tables and 64 registers, which for reference is four times the density of the UltraScale Plus CLB. These can provide the registers for fur delay taps and the registers and lookup tables for building the logic for multipliers and adders. The PL has three types of on chip memory distributed, block RAM, and ultra RAM. All three can be used for FUR coefficients or data buffering. And the highlights here show changes relative to the UltraScale Plus architecture. For smaller data types and or low order filters, it may be advantageous to implement FURs in the logic, saving the DSP blocks for other functions. In general though, PL-based FUR filters should take advantage of the Versal DSP58 blocks. A DSP58 based implementation will achieve higher FMAX at lower power. The DSP58 is dedicated logic capable of performing the multiply, add, and accumulate operations for a FUR. 
When specifying your fixed point coefficient and data widths, note that the DSP58 can implement up to 27 by 24 bit math with a 58 bit accumulator. Keeping your fixed point data in this range allows for an efficient implementation. Wider coefficients and data can be implemented also, but will require additional DSP blocks. For complex FIRS with complex data and coefficients, a textbook quadratic implementation of the MAC structure will require four DSP58 blocks. Implementations such as the Karatsuba algorithm can reduce this to three DSP blocks. The Versal DSP58 has a new complex MAC mode that supports data and coefficients up to 18 bits wide using only two DSP58 blocks. So for complex filters, keeping your fixed point complex math at 18 bits or less will yield the most efficient implementation in terms of DSP58 utilization. If you need single precision floating point FERS, the DSP58 block also supports 32-bit IEEE 754 math. This reduces the DSP block count to implement floating point calculations by a factor of four relative to previous generation parts. There is also a half precision floating point mode enabled by dedicated half precision to single precision conversion blocks on the A, B, and D inputs. Note that in this mode, the output is still 32-bit single precision floating point, so if you require half precision out, then you still need to convert the output in CLBs or memory. The advantage of half precision is that by reducing the bit widths, the logic, memory, and routing for the data path can be reduced, potentially reducing power dissipation and thermal output. A key document when working with the DSP58 blocks is AM004. You can find AM004 online or in the Xilinx DocNav tool. Here I'm going to pick System and Solution Planning, Overview, and find the DSP Engine Architecture Manual. I'm going to start in Chapter 7. This includes information that applies to developing your own fur filters, starting with how to implement cascaded adder trees. Here we see the direct form implementation of a fur filter showing the adder tree. In most fur cases, the adder tree, such as shown here, will become the worst case path for timing. You can pipeline it, but that adds latency. A better implementation for the filter's add stage is the adder cascade. This takes advantage of the DSP58's post adders to accumulate prior taps sequentially, allowing the adder tree to be implemented in the same DSP58's that handle the coefficient data multiplication. This reduces PL resources required to implement FERS, as well as improves timing by keeping the entire calculation path within the DSP58 columns. Another bit of information is the DSP58 column structure. The DSP58 blocks are arranged in columns of 48. Two columns are aligned side by side, useful for complex math. These columns are then stacked vertically across the die. This sets a device-specific limit on the number of DSP blocks that can be cascaded without using general interconnects. A table of the maximum cascade values is provided, along with a tickle script to read the value for a target versatile device in the tools. Note that this doesn't set a hard limit on the length of your fur, just the number of multiply accumulate stages before a pipeline interconnect is required to join vertical columns. Another consideration that applies to cases where your incoming sample rate is lower than the filter's clock rate is TDM. This section provides guidance on how to reduce resources and power for such a filter. And finally, be sure to check out the notes section, which provides some good guidance for coding your own filters or for working with IP filters. In addition to AM004, you should also consult the Versal data sheet for the maximum DSP58 clock frequencies. 
Here we see the numbers for the Versal AI series. With careful design, you can build fur filters that close timing at these rates. So that's a quick overview of the PL domain. Next, consider the AI engines. Since this domain is new, it premiered in the Versal AI parts, I'll spend a little more time covering it. The basic building block for the AI engine array is the AIE tile. There are presently two types of tiles, the AIE tile for Versal AI series and AIE-ML tile for Versal AI Edge series. I'm going to start with the Versal AIE tile shown here. The Versal AIE tile is built around a very long instruction word processor running single instruction multi-data operation. The processor handles scalar, fixed point vector, and floating point vector operations. FER calculations are best implemented as vector operations. The AI engine provides both instruction level and data level parallelism. Instruction level parallelism is defined in the instruction set architecture, whereby one scalar instruction, two moves, two loads, one vector multiplication, and one store instruction, a total of seven operations, can be packed into one very long instruction word. These seven operations occur in parallel and execute in a single clock cycle. Thus, the processor is classified as a seven-way VLIW processor. Data level parallelism is achieved via single instruction multiple data processing where vector level operations handle multiple operands in parallel in a single instruction and single clock cycle. And as shown in the Versal AI data sheet, that clock can run at 1 gigahertz in the slowest speed grade and up to 1.3 gigahertz in the dash 3 speed grade. A differentiator when compared to traditional FPGA design is that there is no timing closure required for the AIE array, since the array is implemented using hard processors with dedicated interconnection memory. AIE designs will run at the user constrained frequency, which can be up to the maximum shown in the data sheet. Now in a FER, data is sampled periodically at a fixed sample rate, and samples are submitted to the filter in time sequence. D0 here represents the most recent sample, D1 the previous older sample, and so on. Coefficients are fixed and do not come in or change, unless of course you're reloading them to change the filter characteristics, an option we'll cover later. For simplicity, let's illustrate a third order FER i.e. four coefficients and three delay taps. For the cascaded adder structure discussed for the PL domain, that filter could be structured as shown here. Quite straightforward. So how is this done in the AIE? For starters, the data and coefficients are packed into vectors. And each element of the vectors carries a sample or a coefficient. Elements can be signed or unsigned, real or complex, and vector widths range from 128 bits to 1024 bits. The vectors are defined using standard C data types and are defined for 8, 16, and 32-bit wide elements. If you have a data type that isn't one of these widths, then you need to convert, typically sign extending up to the nearest supported width, unless your filter requirements afford you the option of converting down to the next smaller type. So our two vectors, one for data, the other for coefficients, are inputs to the AIE. The vectors are written into the registers, the X register in the AIE tile for the data and the Z register for the coefficients. The AIE performs the FER calculations and accumulates the outputs in lanes. The number of lanes can be coded as 4, 8, or 16. Each lane is performing the same operation, but on different elements of the vectors, thus the single instruction multi-data classification. And as for the output, the accumulator lanes are permuted 
into an output vector with any shift, round, saturate adjustments necessary to arrive at the output vector's desired data types. To illustrate selecting vectors, let's work through a simple example. Let's select the vector types for a third order fur with 16-bit complex data and 16-bit real coefficients. Consulting Table 1 in UG1076, reproduced here, we can see that for the example data and coefficient types, each AIE tile can process 16 max per clock cycle. This is the processing ability of one AIE in one clock cycle for the specified data and coefficient types. Since a tile can handle 16 complex times real max per clock, and a third order fur will require four such max, we can readily calculate that we can handle four fur filters per AIE. That translates to four lanes in the accumulator. What we do with those four lanes depends on how the code sets up indexing to extract data and coefficient elements from the vector registers. You could process the vectors as if the four lanes were four independent filters. Or you could calculate four successive outputs of one filter in one clock. Our example uses 16-bit complex data and 16-bit real coefficients. Let's consider the coefficients first. Since the same four coefficients will be used to process successive samples, the coefficient vector needs to hold four 16-bit numbers, a total size of 64 bits. The minimum vector size is 128 bits, so we'll select that width. The fact that half the vector will be unused is not an issue. The coefficient vector can thus be specified as V8 int 16, i.e. a vector of eight elements of type int 16. To determine the data width, consider what the fur filter is doing to process four sample sets. On the first clock, four data elements are multiplied by four coefficients. On the next clock, the next four data elements are multiplied by the same four coefficients. Then the next four, then the next four. So in the end, the data vector needs to hold seven data samples in order to support processing four fur outputs in one operation. Remember these are complex 16-bit numbers, so that's 32 bits per element times 7 for a required size of 224 bits. The closest size is 256 bits, which is a vector capable of holding 8 16-bit complex numbers. Again, the fact that one element is not used is not an issue. So the data vector should be specified as V8 cint 16. So the input vectors are defined as shown here. To determine the accumulator vector type, refer back to UG1076 and note the accumulator width for the data types we're working with. There we note the accumulator type for the operand and data types that we're doing is 48-bit complex. So that's 96 bits per lane across four lanes, which equals 384 bits. That is a supported width, so the accumulator can be specified as V4 C ACC 48. So our vector processor now has vector inputs and a vector accumulator. What remains is the final output vector type. Let's suppose we want to keep the output at 16-bit complex to match the input width. The output vector thus needs to receive four lanes of 16-bit complex output. This is a V4 cint 16, which is a 128-bit vector. Shift round saturate logic on the accumulator output converts the accumulator values to the desired format. We now have a complete set of vectors defined for the vectorized fur implemented in the AIE, and we can run this at 1 gigahertz in the slowest speed grade Versal AI parts. So how does that compare to the DSP-58 implementation? This was our cascaded adder fur in the PL domain, which would require four DSP-58 blocks. For 16-bit complex data, this would need to be doubled to handle real and imaginary, or I and Q, 
data paths. Then, since the AIE processes four sample sets in parallel, it would need to be quadrupled. So, it turns out that one AIE processes the fur versus 32 DSP-58s which tempts us to come up with a resource ratio for planning, but that's not realistic. The resource efficiency of any DSP-58 or AIE FER can vary dramatically depending on the application and the architecture employed. Okay, so the example was a small filter, and we determined that one AIE can implement either multiple instances of that filter or generate multiple outputs for that filter in one clock. So what happens if we need a higher water filter? For a fur with 128 coefficients, the ratio works out to 1 8 which means it will require 8 AIE tiles to implement that fur. In that case, multiple AIE tiles are required to perform fur calculations. To support that, there is a dedicated cascade bus that allows each AIE to pass its accumulator value to a neighbor for calculations to continue. Each AIE can read and write an accumulator value on each clock cycle. The Versal AIE cascade bus is 384 bits wide and spans the entire array in a serpentine path. And what happens if the number is, say, 150? In this case, the ratio is 0 0.106 FERS per AIE, which works out to 9.4 AIEs per FER. So we'll round up to 10 AIEs when planning this filter, knowing that one of the processors will not be fully utilized. Where a tile's processing power is only partially utilized, the compiler can pack multiple functions into a single AIE tile, provided there is enough processing and I.O. capability to support the aggregated calculations. The packing is constrained by the coder using the runtime ratio constraint. See UG1076 for details. If you've designed FPGA-based filters, then you're aware how DSP blocks can utilize pre-adders to support two data samples per MAC for symmetric FERS. The AIE can also double its MAC operations in a similar manner. So when planning for AIE FERS that have symmetric coefficients, you can double the number from the table in UG1076. Which, subtle reminder, is a key document for AIE design. So how do you sort out whether a fur is best implemented in the PL or the AIE array? Start with the data type for the coefficients in data. The AIE offers excellent processing capability for certain data types. For example, a fur with 8-bit coefficients in data can run at 128 max per clock cycle in a single AIE. When the DSP-58 handles 8-bit operations, it handles them at the same rate as the wider data types, 1 MAC per clock cycle. If, however, the data width grows to 9 bits, then the AIE must switch to 16-bit math, which runs at 32 max per AIE. The DSP-58 performance remains the same. For wider data types that fall into the 27 by 24 bit range, the ratio of DSP-58 blocks equivalent to one AIE tile will be lower, as it will also for complex coefficient and data FERS that fall in the 18 bit or less range. The point is, make sure you work out the numbers for your specific application based on the data type, consulting the Versal Datasheet and UG1076 to work out processing capabilities for the two domains. Then architect your system based on which domain best suits your requirements and resources available. Another consideration is power. Admittedly, this is a marketing slide, but the point is that the Versal AI engines can provide increased compute capability and lower power dissipation. To achieve this takes planning, though. For instance, if you're going to utilize the AIE array, then make good use of it. 
the static power to power the array to implement one fur will not give you this power advantage. Filling the array with multiple furs or other functions will give better performance per watt. See the Xilinx Power web page for further information. Earlier, I mentioned there are two kinds of AI engine, the AIE, which we just discussed, and the newer AIE-ML, which is Inversal AI Edge Parts. I'm going to highlight a few differences between the two applicable to fur filters. The key message is here. The AIE-ML and the Edge architecture improve ML performance at the expense of DSP performance. The new data types are shown here definitely slanted more towards machine learning. And the reduced DSP extensions include removal of int32 and native single precision floating point support. There are three architectural changes worth noting. The first change is a doubling of the memory each processor can access in the tile. Applications that require more memory in the array will benefit However, the trade-off is that the space occupied by the memory tiles effectively limits the number of AIE tiles. The second is the addition of a new memory structure, the 4 megabyte accelerator RAM, which allows sharing of data across all compute domains, thereby reducing the dependence on PL-based memory structures and or off-chip memory structures. The third is the cascade bus, in the Versal Edge AIE-ML array, the cascade increases from 384 bits to 512 bits and adds an additional vertical route cascading down each column. In either type of array, you can cascade through the entire array. This addition just expands the placement options for AI tiles when cascading accumulators one point to note when comparing the Versal AI to the Versal AI Edge family is that the processing metrics switch from max to ops. So when interpreting the numbers, remember that a MAC is two ops, a multiply, and an add. The resource chart available online shows the number of AIE-ML blocks in each part. Note that the Edge series is intended to be lower power and in general has smaller AI engine arrays than the Versal AI parts. Also note that one Edge part actually has an AIE tile set instead of AIE-ML. To determine if a filter is best implemented in the AIE or AIE-ML, it's the same case as when comparing AIE to DSP-58. Work out the numbers for your specific application and numeric types. Edge parts with AIE-ML warrant consideration for FERS with smaller data widths, especially 8-bit or 4-bit, but for wider data types or larger projects, the Versal AI parts with AIE may be the best fit. We've covered the programmable logic, DSP-58s, and AI engines. That just leaves the processing system, a.k.a. scalar engines, before we move on to tools and IP. The scalar engines contain the application processing unit, or APU, and real-time processing unit, or RPU, ARMA72 and R5F, respectively. Either can implement FUR calculations in software. So if your FUR is not doing real-time calculations or your sample rate is low enough to allow a software-based implementation, then both are worth considering. The 64-bit A72 lends well to floating point data types, single and double precision. The 32-bit R5 excels in low-power applications. AM011 the Versal ACAP TRM provides further details on both processor types. For the RPU, the integer execution unit and the single and double precision floating point units can be utilized for FUR calculations. For the APU, the Neon SIMD extension is definitely worth checking out. A link is provided to the ARM website where you can learn more about the Neon. 
If I go to the introduction here, you can see that the NEON architecture is a SIMD architecture, very similar in concept to the AI engine. One instruction to multiple data sources, vectorized into lanes for results. The registers in the NEON can be 128 or 64-bit wide vectors. And then those vectors can be operated on with operations such as addition or multiplication. And these operations can be performed in a single clock. Obviously, well suited to building up FERS. There are also some DSP articles on this website. So you can, for instance, check out this particular blog, which discusses some dot matrix operations and structures that obviously would lend themselves pretty well to FER calculations. So processors, AI engines, and programmable logic with DSP-58 blocks can all be used to support FER filters. So let's switch gears now and look at the tool flows. For the overall tool flow, I suggest you reference UG1504. This details the different system level design approaches and provides links to GitHub examples and tutorials for each flow. But that's another topic. Today we're going to limit the focus to the tool flows and IP required to develop the fur portion of your design. I'm going to start with the Vivado IP catalog and the FER compiler that's in there. This addresses probably the majority of FER applications out there, but it targets only the PL. So if you want your FER in the PL, this is worth a look. Uh, you find it in the IP catalog here. It installs along with Vivado. Just do a search on FER. And there we go. There, there is a complete user guide, so I'm not going to walk you through a step-by-step, -step, but I just want to point out a couple things. So first of all, the, the buttons and knobs to change your fur are all on the right side. And here, there's a division that you can actually pull around a little bit. It helps to have room over here. On the left side is a portal into seeing what you're doing, what, what the current fur is you know, doing as far as implementation, you know, how many resources is it using, and frequency response. And another neat thing is in, in a lot of these, the little keystrokes, like holding down the left button and dragging up, can, can move you around and do different things within the viewport. So I can zoom in, for instance, zoom out, and zoom fit. Kind of helpful if you want to look, for instance, at, at your passband here and just look at it in more detail. The other thing is coefficients, you can do them two ways. You can put in a vector, which is what we have here. It, it starts up with a vector, in this case is 21 um, coefficients and it looks like they're symmetric. Uh, the other thing you can do is a COE file, which has been, for many years, the standard for importing coefficients into Xilinx. Now, you can also cut and paste in, into the vector if you wish. So that gives you the ability to link whatever filter design package you have into the logic core here. Um, in this case, what I'm going to start with is the channel specification. Now, if you look right now, the, the fur filter is doing a lot of clock cycles per input. It's doing a lot of TDM because it's got a very low sample frequency and a moderate clock frequency. I'm going to go ahead and just put both of those at 500 megahertz. It does a lot of recalculation anytime you enter a number, and sometimes that takes a few seconds, so be patient there. But at this point, I've put in the, the inputs are coming in at 500 mega samples per second, and the system clock is running at 500 megahertz. So this is now going to be a one to one where we're bringing in one sample per, in, you know, one input per clock, generating one output per clock, and we only bring in one input at a time. So if we look at the symbol there, that would reflect that. So we're going to have, in this case, 16 bits in. And with bit growth, we'll have 24 bits out. The bit growth and everything is covered here. So I could, for instance, limit this to, say, truncating the LSBs to give me 16 bits. And now, when I look, I've got 16 out and 16 in. 
So now I'm going to use the Implementation Details tab here to look, and we're using 21 DSP slice counts right now for the 21 coefficients. If I went ahead and changed this to symmetric and point out that the, the coefficients are guaranteed to be symmetric, it now drops to 11 DSP slices. So now I'm going to switch over to the Detailed Implementation tab, and this is where I can influence the resource decisions and what optimizations are done. Uh, starting with the architecture, which right now is just showing one choice, the systolic. What I can do, and that's, that's because I'm, not, I'm in symmetric. Um, for symmetric, you don't have architecture choices. For non-symmetric, then I can pick between the systolic and the transpose. So if you watch the startup latency and the coefficients on the left there, you'll notice this changes. So I've now dropped to a, a reduced startup latency of 9 because I switched to the transposed architecture. The goals tell you how, you know, what, what do you want to focus on, area, speed, or custom. Custom opens up all of these choices where you can influence a lot of details. Uh, see the user guide for that. Then the memory options, we discussed that there are distributed in the different block memories. You can sweat, switch between these for all the different buffering and coefficient storage that you need for the filter here. So you can influence which resource gets used. And finally, remember the DSV58s. They live in columns going up, and every device has a device-specific column height, and that's your limit before you have to do a pipeline interconnect down to the next column. Um, for the particular device I have chosen, it's 164. Uh, we're currently doing one chain of 21, so we're not stressing it right now. Uh, in, a, in a minute, I'll, I'll go ahead and pull in a larger filter and show you just, just how it works there. But even if with a small filter, I can switch it out of automatic mode, which automatic tries to line it up in one column if it can. Um, and if it can't, it does the, the inner column jumps. I'm going to put it to custom. And what happens now is this gray box is no longer gray. And it's defaulting to putting all 21 in one column, which is what the automatic decided. I could, for instance, for my 21 taps, go 10, 10, and 1. It stays red until I've accounted for all of them. So now I've accounted for all 21. I'm going to have a column that goes up 10 DSP58s then an interconnect that drops down with column which runs up 10, another interconnect with a pipeline of 5, and then 1. So if I change this, there's two of these interconnects that are pipeline between the three columns. So if I say to change the 5 to a 6, then I should go up 2 on the latency here. So as soon as I hit enter, there you go, and we go up to 20. So this is how you can control the detailed placement of your DSP blocks even. Um, why would you ever do that? Well, if you're trying to keep one area of the chip free so some other logic can use the DSP58 blocks in the upper part of the column, you might want to crush your filters down to the lower part and kind of limit the height, even if it could have been in one cascade, break it up and keep it kind of squished down in the vertical sense. So now I'm going to switch to MATLAB and generate those coefficients just to get a longer filter. So bear with me and we'll go ahead and tighten up some requirements, forcing it up into a higher order. Double check the response. Double check the order, 198. Now I just need to convert the filter object in MATLAB into the COE format for Xilinx. And there we have the COE file. So now I'll come back here, import it, and there we go. And 98 coefficients. So now that we've got these 198 coefficients into the filter, we'll return to the detailed implementation tab and note the column arrangement. The automatic mode fills up the first column, 164 blocks in this case, then places the remaining 34 blocks in the next column. We could customize that to, for instance, balance the 198 into two columns of 99. There's no real reason to do that other than device floor planning. 
Another little point to note, the number of commas in this column configuration gives you a quick tally on the number of inter-column connections, in this case one. And the number of pipelines you put in here can go up or down. You can decrease it if you want to improve your latency, or you can increase it if you need to improve timing. So that's a quick overview of the FUR compiler. It should cover many of your general FUR applications, so why would you use another approach for appeal-based FUR? To answer that, I'm going to open the product guide. And first note the feature support matrix. There are two architectures supported, and for those you have the, the parameterization you can do here. If your requirements fall outside of these limits, then you need to consider another approach. The second point to note is the filter configuration support matrix. If you need a type of filter other than the supported types here, then you need to consider another solution. And the third point is the notable limitations. These, these are release specific. In this case, we're on 7.2, so make sure you have the document that matches your FUR compiler. Um, so if any of these limitations impact your particular application, then again, you need another solution. So the next other solution I'll cover is coding your own FUR in VHDL, Verilog, or System Verilog. So what resources are available to support HDL coded FURs? For starters, consult the documentation for guidelines on coding to simplify the integration of your code. I'll also note the best practices. So here you got requirements and down here some quick summarized best practices. Another good resource is the language templates under Tools Language Templates. Select your HDL, in this case I'm looking at the VHDL. Go to Synthesis Constructs, Example Modules, DSP, and you'll find examples of how to code a FUR, as well as basic building blocks. Um, the equivalent also exists, for instance, in Verilog here. In the PL domain discussion, it was stated that FUR filters should utilize the DSP-58 blocks for optimal power and performance. Returning to the AM004 document that we referenced in that discussion, you can find details on a variety of FUR architectures. Combining these architectures with the coding guidelines and templates should allow you to code a FUR specifically for your requirements. In addition to writing your own HDL, you can generate VHDL or Verilog code to implement FUR filters using Xilinx Model Composer. Model Composer runs in the MATLAB Simulink environment. Within the Simulink graphical editor, you can model a FUR, simulate the FUR, generate VHDL or Verilog code for synthesis, and even interact directly with hardware. This tool adds extensive simulation capability beyond simulating RTL. You can model a golden reference fur in the floating point domain using Simulink blocks, build your own fur using synthesizable Xilinx blocks, then drive the inputs to both with various signal sources, and compare the outputs using virtual instruments such as scopes or spectrum analyzers. The options for FURS in this flow include a simple-to-use library element that covers single-channel filters with integer interpolation and or decimation rates. When you drop it into a Simulink model, it prompts for the coefficient width and then allows you to enter key FUR parameters and optionally utilize a built-in filter design and analysis tool to generate coefficients for a variety of filter types. Other options for coefficients include entering directly as a vector or loading from the MATLAB workspace. In addition to the simple FUR, you can instantiate the Logicor FUR compiler, which was the first IP we discussed. This brings together the convenience of the FUR compiler and the simulation capabilities of the model composer environment. The FUR compiler can also be used as a block to architect application-specific FURs, such as this 273-tap symmetrical interpolate-by-2 filter, 
which brings data in at one giga sample per second and outputs data at two giga samples per second. This example is part of the tool's documentation, which you can open by tapping XL doc at the MATLAB prompt. Zooming out on that model, you can see the FER compiler is used here to build up eight individual filter paths, with each filter taking select coefficients from the 273. In this way, the convenience of the FER compiler can be leveraged to build up a more complex architecture than the compiler alone can achieve. You can enter demo block set xilinx at the MATLAB prompt to get a list of the example designs, including this one. In addition to the simple FER and the FER compiler, there is a SSR category in the Xilinx block sets which supports vectorized data and includes a vectorized FER. Vectorized rates, input and output, allow you to work at super sample rates, i.e. sample rates that are higher than the system clock rate. There are also lower level blocks that allow you to build up your own FER architecture. And perhaps key for that approach would be the DSP58 block, which provides access to directly configuring the Versal's DSP block, and the DSP CPLX, which, as we discussed further, supports a two DSP block complex multiplier. An associated block that will be important, potentially, is the op mode block. And I'll show you why in just a second here. So what happens is if you go into either of these DSP primitives, you can consolidate the control ports, all of these different options where you, you control the way the BSP blocks. It collapses them into an OP input. So I'm going to do that for both of these. And then what you can do is drive that port with the op mode primitive and then go into the op mode primitive, make sure you set it to the proper DSP block type, for instance, DSP58, and you can then select the operation. So here I'm going to go into the DSP op mode, set it to the complex, and there we go, we have the A times B. So that's how you would control at the primitive level, making the connections between DSP blocks, setting them into the proper operating mode, and then building up the rest of your data path. Also, since the DSP blocks can change modes dynamically, you could insert a MUX from the Xilinx block set, drive that into the operation mode, and then have different modes with a state machine or a counter to select between them. So with this approach, you can build some very efficient FERS, and you can build super sample rate FERS, and you can do time division multiplexing to be very efficient on resources. Well, we've been going through the building blocks. You may have noticed that the Xilinx toolbox has three distinct categories, AIE, HDL, and HLS. If you're familiar with the Xilinx tools, then you knew the HDL block set, which we just discussed as system generator. The HLS block set you knew as model composer. And the AI engine block set is new, specifically to support the versatile parts with AI engines. The three categories differ in their levels of abstraction and in the outputs they generate. The HDL category operates at the lowest level of abstraction, close to the hardware, and generates VHDL or Verilog output. The HLS category operates at the algorithm or formula level and generates C++ for HLS synthesis. The AIE flow generates AIE code targeting, of course, the AIE array. We'll wrap up coverage for the PL domain design entry by covering the HLS category. To consider the level of abstraction, take a look at the math functions. You won't see low-level hardware-centric blocks such as DSP58 or DSP-CPLX, 
what you will see is mathematical operators. Combined with the HLS Boolean table and other blocks, these can be used to build up the multiply, add, accumulate calculations that comprise a FER. The design entry and simulation is essentially the same as for the HDL flow, just using a different Xilinx block set. So this is a good transition point to change from the PL domain to the AIE domain, starting with Model Composer AIE. To target the AI Engine Array from Model Composer, we'll need to use blocks from the AI Engine block set. In the DSP category, you can find a number of fur filters, and this is a growing collection. You drop those fur filter models into your design, and here we see in this sub-block the AI for asymmetric. And you can set the data input and output types. These are based on C data types. And you can reference the coefficients that you did with the FDA tool. Set up a window block size for bringing the vectors in and out of the fur. Set your sample rate, your scaling, and your rounding or truncation. And then once you've got all that, you can simulate and view the output on the instrumentation. In this case, it tracks very well, so it looks good. You then open the Model Composer hub block where you can set your target to the AI engines, generate and run, which builds the whole project, and then open the Vitus Analyzer. The Vitus Analyzer gives you a really good view of the whole overall AI engine project. In this case, we see the kernels that make up this filter. We see the inputs and the outputs, and you see the internal memory buffers. You can also view it in the physical domain so here we see the entire array, and here we see this particular filter within that array placed in these AI engine blocks. Um, you can look at the overall simulation, and here we can see the startup and then the data flowing, and you can actually look in more detail on a trace view here. So that's the quick view of the AI engine flow, very similar to the other flows, except you add the Vitus analyzer into the mix and you're drawing your blocks from the AI engine block set. If the predefined fur filters do not meet your requirements, then you can code your own and integrate them into the model using the user-defined functions. AIE code consists of kernel code and graph code. Kernel code defines operations targeting a single AI engine. Graph code instantiates and interconnects kernels. Both are typically coded in C++ using the AIE API, although kernels can also be developed using C with intrinsics. In the user-defined function blocks, you will see a block to import graphs and two blocks to import kernels, depending on whether they utilize C++ classes or not. There's also an HLS kernel block, which allows you to mix HLS kernels in the model along with your AIE kernels. And in the interfaces category, you see blocks to support interfaces between AIE, HLS, and HDL domains. If you prefer to work without MATLAB Simulink, then you can code for the AI engines using Vitus. Vitus supports command line, scripted, and IDE GUI flows. And for fur filters in Vitus, the DSP lib, part of the Vitus open source libraries, is a good place to start. This library is available for free download on GitHub. As of 2021.1, the library includes AIE engine graph and kernel code for the same filters available in the Model Composer DSP blocks. The DSP lib, as it's referred to, is in this folder here, and you'll notice it's organized into different subfolders, L1, L2, and L3. The DSP L1 is kernel and test bench source code. Here, for example, in the source directory, you see the same fur filters that were available in the MATLAB model composer flow for AIE. L2 is the graph level code. This is the suggested way that you include predefined AIE filters into your code. So 
in general, you can reference the L2 graph code and pull in the complete interfaced kernel, or you can pull in the L1 and, and just work out your own graph. L3 is reserved for future use and will contain software drivers where applicable. So just to illustrate a quick way to build from the command line, I've gone into the DSP library L2 tests AIE. And there we can see a number of the filters. And say I wanted to do a fur single rate symmetrical. So I will go to fur single rate symmetrical. I can then enter a command line make argument with parameters. So here I can do a make all, so it's going to build the whole project from start to finish. And I specify data types, coefficient types, the length of the fur, and all the other options that, for instance, in the model composer, we double clicked on the filter block to go ahead and enter these parameters. Here we just put them up on the command line. To write your own code using the DSP library fur filters, you would structure as shown here. The Adaptive Data Flow ADF header defines the extensions required to support AIE vector programming, including the vector data types. The next header is from the Include folder of the DSP lib L2 level folder. Obviously define the parameters for the fur, then the coefficients, and then your fur itself. If you prefer to work in the Vitus IDE instead of from the command line, then this is how your project will appear. Note that this project has both PL and AI engine domains. The flow is typical IDE. You set up your target, build the project, then either run or optionally run in debug mode with breakpoints and stepping options. In this particular project, the kernel code defines a fur directly in the code as opposed to pulling from the DSP library. Note the vector operations that are defined in the ADF namespace. Here the vectors are read in, accumulated through various multiply operations, then written out with an appropriate shift round saturate. After compilation, you have the same Vitus Analyzer capability as what I showed in the Model Composer. So here I can launch the Vitus Analyzer and see the graph view showing the kernel and the graph, the array view showing the physical placement within the AI Engine array, and the simulator output. Note, however, the simulator output is text-based with timestamps. Um, this is one reason I pointed out that the Model Composer AIE environment is preferred by many DSP designers uh, based on the simulation. So, for AI engines, you can choose DSP library or code your own, Vitus or Vitus Model Composer, IDE or command line. As we wrap up, there is one domain left which has many tool flow options. In terms of fur filters, though, the calculations are implemented in software along with the rest of your code. In short, implementing a fur in software is unlikely to impact your choice of language or development tools. It simply becomes part of your overall code. Thank you for watching as we covered compute domains, tool flows, and libraries of IP. May all your filters give you the proper response.